So this is our third Cafe Sci of the season. Uh, uh, we are going to hear from one of the one of the most distinguished, i.e., he's been here for a very very long time. Scientist here. Um, before I get to that, though, can I? If you have never been to Bigelow before, can you raise your hand? Love it. Okay, I love the first timers. Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Deborah Bronk. I am the president and CEO of this amazing place. And we do these talks um, in the summer to try to bring our science that, um, that we do here to the community. And um, we are a research institution um, uh, that does work um, with... I'm not being very articulate right now. We do, re we do research in ocean science. We study the base of the ocean food web, which is really the microbes. Our funding is about 80% of federal contracts and grants. And so I thank all of the taxpayers in the room. 20% uh, of our funding comes from our donors and supporters, of which I see many in the audience. And we are very grateful for all of them. We could not do what we do without you. I want to especially thank um, H.M. Payson, their uh, main base financial advisor, who has been a long-term supporter of Bigelow, and they support the Cafe Size series every summer. So we are very, very uh, grateful to them. So during the course of the, of the lecture, we will stop twice for questions, one midway through and one at the end. For those of you, um, welcome everybody. I have to remember, I also have a bunch of people on the screen. Um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you can send those in and Fritz will monitor those. So please, if you have any questions, let's, let's talk about it. We, it's, we really try to get some good conversations going. So now it is my pleasure, though, to get to the main event today, um, and that is um, to introduce Dr. Barney Balch, who is a researcher here. Um, Barney has a very, very long history at Bigelow. Um, it started back, this is back in 1972, as he said before orthodontists got to him, um, where he worked as a laboratory technician for Clarice and Charlie Yench, who are the founders of the lab. That's been back when they were at the University of Massachusetts Marine Station in Gloucester, Massachusetts. He then went on to be a lab tech for them from uh, nine, uh, 74 to 79. That's when the lab was on the west side of town over by um, the main Department of Marine Resources. He, uh, he went on to get his BS at Cornell and his PhD at Scripps. And this is a shot of Barney um, next to Charlie. Um, and he, uh, Charlie is the guy playing the jug I, I he called it a jug, but what is very thrilling to, to me is that in the corner you have um, Dick Epley. So Dr. Dick Epley was just a, a god in the field. My entire research career basically was following on um, what Dick Epley did, and Barney is a student of, of Dick Epley. Um, Barney still plays the trombone. He will be playing. Where are you playing on Friday? Uh, uh, Booth Bay Opera House uh, next Friday. So. It's August next 5th. Friday. Yeah. Okay. So at the <laughs> Hopper House next Friday, um, novel jazz. It's an incredible jazz band. So he's multi-talented. Um, Barney then went on. He spent time as a tenured professor at the University of Miami Rosensteel School of Marine Science. And then he came to Bigelow in uh, 1995. So it's really kind of a beautiful story of, of coming home. And he has been a leader in the field. Um, he studies phytoplankton and the use of, of satellite oceanography, which really Charlie Yench was the father of satellite oceanography. So it, it, it really does come full circle. So with that, I will give you Barney Bulch. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you very much for having me. Um, let's see. Okay, my story starts uh, in, in, with this map of the Gulf of Maine, the fishing banks of the Gulf of Maine from 1918. And the Gulf of Maine has been known as a productive fishing ground for centuries. People say, oh, the Gulf of Maine, it's, it's known for the fishing that goes on here, and it's a highly productive region. Um, and the namesake of this laboratory, laboratory uh, Henry Bigelow, here shown about the same time as this chart was printed. Here he is on the, uh, his schooner, Grampus, 
and he was plying these waters, uh, doing basic oceanography. He is considered the father of modern oceanography, bringing new techniques. Now, mind you, this was in the early 1900s. Um, but uh, he also was known as a holistic thinker. He, and this laboratory really uh, still strives to do that. We don't have departments. Bigelow felt that, you know, people should know about chemical oceanography and biological oceanography, and physical oceanography. And indeed, he did all this. If you look at the work that Bigelow did, uh, published in, in these days, he had thousand page treatises uh, that covered all the biology and chemistry of the oceanography of, uh, of the Gulf of Maine. So um, this is an important place to start this journey uh, uh, because I'm gonna be talking about the productivity of the Gulf of Maine. And, and there have been questions, uh, you know, we, we talk about these fertile fishing grounds as though they've always been fertile and they're always going to be fertile fishing grounds. And uh, from here, the story goes uh, over to a satellite image. This is a satellite image of um, chlorophyll, the plant material that's in all the trees that you're looking at outside the window right now. And uh, areas that are colored red are areas of elevated chlorophyll and areas that are colored blue. Let's see if I can use my pointer here. There we go. Uh, air, over here, areas that are colored blue have less chlorophyll. And uh, the, the thing about this, which is really remarkable, is that you're looking at phytoplankton, microscopic phytoplankton that are teeming in the waters of the Gulf of Maine. And you can see it from space. And what, and what you're looking at is differences in ocean color. Basically, the more plants that are in that water, the greener the water is, the bluer the water, uh, the less uh, plant material is in there. And um, we know about this. We, this, as Debbie said, Bigelow Laboratory was very important in the founding of, of the principles here. Uh, so uh, here's Charlie Yinch who developed the mathematical and optical means to interpret the color of the ocean in terms of the amount of chlorophyll or the biomass of phytoplankton. So how much of this material was in the water? And we it, basically, uh, we owe that aspect to Charlie. And on your way out, you can see a little story about him on the, on the wall there to, uh, in back. Um, so, in the days that Charlie was doing this, uh, he was one of eight members on what was called the NASA NET team. There were eight people that were in charge of figuring out how to put this uh, satellite called the Coastal Zone Color Scanner, CCCS for short, uh, into space and, and how to interpret the data. And uh, the Coastal Zone Color Scanner here uh, basically operated for eight years. It was a very primitive instrument, uh, but it was proof of concept, and it basically showed that it could be done. This is the first ocean color sensor, uh, Earth-looking ocean color sensor that uh, there ever was. And on the right here um, is the sensor, one of the main workhorses that's still up at present. It was launched in 2002, uh, and it's called Modus Aqua. And uh, some of the images uh, that you'll see today uh, come from Modus Aqua. Both of these things were polar orbiting satellites. They went around the Earth, go around the Earth every 90 minutes as the Earth rotates beneath them. And they basically cover the Earth. They image the Earth every two days completely. It's really, it's amazing technology. It's amazing to think that you can see phytoplankton from space or see their effects from space. So. From here, you know, with anything uh, high tech like a satellite, um, it can be garbage in and garbage out if you don't really know what that satellite is looking at. And so it's been important. Charlie was doing this in the early days of CCCS. You have to have somebody on the water with a bucket 
or a pipe and they're pumping seawater into an instrumentation to really know what that satellite is looking at so that you can interpret those data. And so that's where the story begins really for what I'm gonna tell you about, uh, NATS, not the bugs, but the acronym there for the Gulf of Maine North Atlantic Time Series. And it's a 23 year transect time series. What's a transect time series? It's basically a transect across the widest part of the Gulf of Maine between Portland, Maine and Yarmouth, Nova Scotia that we do over and over and over again. Um, and a few aspects of the NATS work. There are two goals of NATS. There are two goals of NATS. One is validation of ocean color satellites. There are many more satellites up there now than, than I've shown you, uh, but it's, this principle is still true. You have to have somebody on the water and uh, making those measurements at the instant that the, the satellite is overhead. It's about four minutes for an overpass to go from the horizon to the other horizon. We know right where it's gonna be in the sky and, and we're praying that the, there are no clouds in the way uh, when this happens. Um, and so that's validation of ocean color satellites. The other thing, uh, the second part here is uh, a transect time series to answer the question, how is the Gulf of Maine changing? We also, uh, as I mentioned, we sample the same transect, the same, the same cruise track over and over because we use ferries uh, as our ships of opportunity or when the ferries aren't running, research vessels. Um, and by running the transect over and over again, we have much better statistical precision to know what the properties of the Gulf of Maine are and if they're changing in this very highly dynamic environment. With NASA's help, we built a mobile laboratory to ride on the back of a flatbed truck, which carries all of our scientific instruments aboard ferries. Uh, and we essentially turn these ferries into research vessels. Uh, one of the advantages of this is it cuts our ship time costs by about a factor of 100. Remember what Debbie was saying about uh, taxpayers funding all of this. Ship time is very, very expensive. But if we can get a ticket to go on a ferry, A, we can look at the weather the day before and say, oh, it's going to be, there's big high pressure system coming in. We're going to go tomorrow and we scramble and we drive the truck down to the ferry terminal and we drive aboard. Um, and it's way cheaper. So it's about a factor of 100 in terms of the ship time. And finally, it, there is a trade-off with ferry sampling. I can't ask the captain of the ferry to stop the ship to allow me to put a cable down in the water to measure water samples from deep down in the Gulf of Maine. However, the satellite, the that's that's not great for a research vessel if you're in the business of oceanography. But the other part is satellites, most of what satellites see are the surface water anyway, the top couple of meters of the water. So uh, it's actually a beautiful match for, with NASA for doing the satellite validation. So uh, I call this NATS by the numbers, just a little bit about uh, what we've done uh, we've operated for 23 years across the Gulf of Maine, the widest part of the Gulf of Maine. 215 cruises that were two to four days each, uh, depending on the ship that we were working on. Um, we validated uh, about 700 overpasses on clear sky days by ocean color satellites under clear skies. Think of these satellite uh, uh, overpasses as flyovers. Um, and we provided NASA with about 19% of their ocean color validation globally in the Gulf of Maine. And that's mainly because we had the ability to be out there on clear sky days. It doesn't always work. Some days we'd be out there and we're, we know the overpass is in, in 10 minutes and we're watching the cloud front get closer and closer. And, and sure enough, the cloud front comes over and the satellite goes over and it's a bust. But uh, we've sampled 40,800 miles, which is the equivalent of 1.8 times around the Earth. 
Uh, and we've done 29 autonomous glider missions. These are robots I'm going to tell you a little bit about in the next slide. These are robots that we set loose uh, near Seguin Island, and they go down to this line that goes across the Gulf of Maine, and they swim over. It takes about 26 days to 30 days to go over to the other side of the Gulf of Maine and swim back. And meanwhile, these things collect uh, information. We've these 29 autonomous missions, that's 586 days at sea. Now, if you have teenagers that you've sent out on the road uh, with their driver's license uh, the first time at night, and you're wondering about whether they're gonna come home, uh, multiply that by a factor of a couple of hundred, and that's what it's like to have one of these robots, which are very expensive, out by themselves. They don't have eyes. They just come up and they communicate through satellite telemetry. Uh, and then they go back down and uh, you always are wondering if you're going to see them the next morning. Okay, uh, the autonomous silicon electric gliders. So we have two of them. Uh, Henry is one after uh, Henry Bigelow and Grampus after Bigelow Schooner. And uh, the top picture shows uh, uh, Henry uh, patiently waiting to start uh, his mission, it's a he, uh, over to, to uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, at the bottom, um, there's a, a, this is a section um, showing, uh, this is depth on this axis, and along here is longitude. And so Portland is on this side, Nova Scotia is on this side, and this is temperature as you go across uh, the Gulf of Maine. And there's an arrow down there for a very specific reason, which is to point out that uh, for this particular trip, the water down at 200 meters was 10 degrees Celsius. And the water at the surface was about three and a half degrees Celsius. So people usually look at that and they say, oh, wait a minute, that's, that's not wrong, though. Though, that's not right, though. The water's supposed to be warm on top and cold on the bottom. Well, this water that's down there, we're gonna come back to this. This is deep water from the North Atlantic. It's warm water from the North Atlantic, which is coming into the Gulf of Maine. And it's, it's a big deal, but that's a seven degree Celsius difference between the top and the bottom. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to show you a couple of movies. Uh, the first one, and, and uh, I'm, I'm basically starting this story from outside of the Gulf of Maine. We're going to be looking at global temperature, which is uh, data collected by NOAA and NASA for years. Actually, uh, some of these data, there are temperatures from, uh, uh, this is surface uh, temperatures on, on the earth or at sea, uh, the surface water, and uh, they go back to the 1800s. And this movie will take you from the 1800s to now, essentially, showing you anomalies of temperature. So how do they figure what's an anomaly? They take all the temperature that's been measured, they calculate the average temperature, for that whole data set. And then at any one time, they say, is it colder or is it the same or is it warmer? Uh, uh, and these anomalies allow one to look at see how the ocean is warming or cooling. So let's start this movie. So um, the areas that are in red have positive temperature anomalies of up to four degrees. This is in Fahrenheit. Um, and the, the blue areas have anomalies uh, down to that's minus four degrees. So they're, they're colder than on, on average. So we're up just the 70s. And you can see that the, uh, the, the Earth is starting to look a little bit redder and redder and redder. So the, the temperatures on Earth have changed over the course of the last century. And, and but that's both water and, and uh, land. Okay, so it's, it may be a little hard to see this uh, image uh, with the lighting in here, but here goes. Um, this is a, an image by NPP Veers. It's another uh, satellite that belongs to NOAA. Here's the arm of Cape Cod right here. And there's this line is the Nats line. 
and there's Portland and Yarmouth, and things to note about this complicated place we call the Gulf of Maine. Um, there, is, there are different water masses. It's not all mixed up in one homogenous soup. There are actually very well-defined water masses out there. There's water called Scotian shelf water that comes into the Gulf of Maine that's come down along the coast of uh, Nova Scotia, the East Coast. Uh, that water comes into the Gulf of Maine and it goes up into the Bay of Fundy, where it had, there are all those big tides that mix that water top to bottom. And that water then travels down on the, the east coast of uh, Maine here. And uh, this is called Eastern Maine Coastal Current. And then that water is bumped offshore by this. There's some topography there that, that pushes that water offshore right across our Nats line. And that's called the extension of the Eastern Maine Coastal Current. And then some of that water continues south as the Western Maine Coastal Current. And, and while it's a little tough to see here, there are some differences in color. This is a satellite image, which is called a true color image. Uh, this is what the, the, the color of the water would look like. Right over here, I think you hopefully can see there's a color boundary there, which really demarcates where this Eastern Maine Coastal Current is. Okay, I'm gonna show you a little video about what is Nats. And uh, it, it, pictures are worth a thousand words. Here we are out at sea on uh, the Nova Star Ferry. There's Dave Drapeau. And we're, uh, here we are in our, this is our mobile laboratory. Um, and uh, some shots of Bigelow, and that was our, our mobile laboratory. Um, here are a couple of shots of me expounding about something or other, I'm not sure what. Um, and Bruce Bowler here uh, inside the mobile lab, uh, and Dave, who was working up on the bow, that's Meredith White, who was postdoc at the time. And we have the ship instrumented out with sensors on the bow, sensors topside, uh, for looking at light coming down. Light, this, this device here is looking at skylight as well as uh, light coming up from the sea surface. We're making the same measurements that the satellites make. Uh, and this is the cruise track. We go over at night and we're basically setting everything up, getting all the instruments calibrated, getting uh, the everything secured. And then uh, on the trip back, we're doing measurements. Here I'm doing some temperature measurements. Uh, and uh, then there's some uh, shots in the lab. Dave is here calibrating a light scattering sensor here. And uh, calibration of these, these instruments is absolutely critical. So you can calibrate them to standards and you know exactly what the light properties are. Here I am with a, a what's called a reflectance plaque. And we put this underneath a radiometer and it gives us a very precise reading that we can compare. This tells us if we're, uh, the radiometer is well calibrated. The ships, uh, oh, here's a, a flow cam. This is a device uh, that looks at individual particles as we're steaming across and it sizes them. It, we can identify them. Here I am uh, putting a bucket over the side to get a sample, which we uh, are going to use for measuring primary productivity. Um, so we have about 300 different data streams that we're taking as the ship is steaming across. And at about uh, 20 knots, or if we're on the cat, we're doing uh, 38 knots. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty fast research, and we're taking water samples the whole way. Okay, so at, for a cruise, we go out, and this is a satellite image of uh, what's called particulate organic carbon, just basically particles that are living, organic matter, and uh, areas that are green are elevated, and this is the coast of Maine. This is a cloud right here, and then uh, Nova Scotia is here, and this uh, dashed line goes between Portland, Maine and Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, and we're, and we're sailing along this. And so we have one of the data streams that we collect is particulate organic carbon. And here it is to where we actually measure it in a calibrated way. And so we can quantify as the ship steams across and we can verify against the satellite what it's seeing. And then we have a glider out there 
which is a slightly different time, longer time scale to do this, but it also is measuring particular organic carbon. And we can get a three-dimensional view, if you will, of how that material is varying top to bottom uh, across the Gulf of Maine. So the combination of the ferry and the glider is really powerful. Okay, this is a visualization that NASA just made for us uh, in honor of a paper that we just published about 20 years of work in the Gulf of Maine. And here it's showing the warming of the Gulf of Maine. Um, and, and now that that's surface temperature, now you're going to be looking at the bathymetry, the depths of the Gulf of Maine, and you're seeing the individual trips uh, in rapid fire as we're uh, uh, going back and forth across the Gulf, filling in all these temperature data. The area right over in this part uh, is uh, the Northeast Channel. It's the main way that deep water gets into the Gulf of Maine. And you'll, you might see it on the way as we come back around, there's a canyon there where that North Atlantic warm water that I was telling you about comes into the Gulf. Now it shows the glider missions that we did, again, sped up in time. Uh, we've been running these since 2008, and uh, you see the gliders, they don't stay exactly on the line because they're pretty strong currents there, but we, pretty much, we, we, we do a good job of keeping them within a couple of kilometers of that line. So uh, here is a, a section for uh, one time of year. And as same time of year, later on in the time series when we're starting to see a lot of warm water coming into the Gulf. Now, as we pan out, uh, you'll note the Gulf Stream, which is right here. And that boundary is a very important boundary to what I'm gonna be telling you about. Uh, and that's carrying a ton of heat from the tropical regions up headed towards Europe. So I'm gonna show you a couple other videos to help hopefully convince you about these big influences on the Gulf of Maine. There are two things I'm gonna show you in the next two movies. One is temperature of the North Atlantic, uh, and, and you'll see the Gulf Stream again with a circulation model. Um, and then I'll be showing you something about salinity. So let's take a look at this uh, temperature one. This is now, uh, uh, this is a combination of model and, and temperature data. You'll see the temperatures fill in here shortly, uh, showing basically they construct these models based on sea surface height, believe it or not. You, you can ask me about that later. But the warm water here, it's getting colder. Look up here. There's cold water that's coming around uh, Newfoundland and this water, some of it heads out this way to the east. Some of it comes right down the coast here and goes by the Gulf of Maine, right by that channel that I was telling you about, the Northeast Channel. And uh, it's an amazingly complex, uh, it's a beautiful, you know, watching the ocean circulation is absolutely mesmerizing. Um, now I'm going to show you, NASA launched a satellite a couple of years ago uh, called Aquarius. And Aquarius has the capability of measuring salinity. Uh, ask me later if you want to know how to do it. Um, this is a movie <clears throat> showing Aquarius data uh, for the globe. And they start with a rotating globe, and then they superimpose on it salinity data. And while we're talking about the Gulf of Maine, consider this a little uh, a lesson about the global salinity distribution. So here is salinity data collected by the Aquarius satellite. And you'll notice there are red areas here, which are high salinity regions. That's where evaporation is more than precipitation. So the salt is getting concentrated. And then there are blue areas where from melting ice, uh, uh, there's, um, or there's more rainfall, you get lower salinities. There are also, uh, it's gonna take it, this visualization is gonna take us over to the Pacific just for a second, and then we're gonna come back to the Atlantic. But uh, now in the Pacific, there's a huge band of low salinity water, the blue is low salinity, uh, and that is from the fact that the precipitation, the rainfall, is greater than the evaporation. It's an area in the tropics of huge rainfall. Uh, 
So we're going to zip over the Atlantic now, and then we'll talk about rivers. Here's the Amazon River, and you'll see these, these burps of fresh water associated with rainstorms that are coming out. And the same thing is happening in the Gulf of Maine. We have rivers, lots of rivers that empty into the Gulf of Maine and which cause the salinity to go down. Now we're gonna tip the, the globe tips and, and we'll get a better look at what's happening up here, which is really what I wanna show you. The Labrador Sea is here. You see the ice sheets going back and forth and it's sending this cool water, melting ice, uh, and down along the coast of Nova Scotia. And some of that water goes into the Gulf of Maine. Some of the fresh water is collected uh, off the land and flows into the Gulf of Maine. So I'm gonna end this there. And so before I'm gonna tell you uh, uh, the evidence for the change that we see, but this is a good spot to stop for questions. And uh... so any questions? Yeah, the, the pictures are all very nice, just in simple terms. Over the life of this research, or even going back to the Bigelow days, how much has the average temperature of the Gulf increased and how much has the pH decreased? Um, I'm going to talk about the pH in the second part of the talk. So uh, I've got some slides on that. Um, the temperature is has gone at the surface temperature, remember, from the ferry. Uh, and I'm going to show you those data as well. Um, we've seen uh, anomalous uh, uh, anomalies of temperature go up uh, three degrees Celsius, three degrees uh, since about 2010, uh, and and it was it was about three degrees colder than that uh, before then. And, but I, I'm going to show you those data too. Just going to remind all the people watching um, remotely that you can submit questions. Um, I was wondering if you could just touch on again um, why when you showed uh, the temperature with like depth and it was like warmer mm. at depth, which is like really bizarre because I feel like it should be rising. Yeah. Why was it warmer at depth? Because, uh, great question, that's a really good question, because it's saltier. So the other part of that equation, and I'll be showing you those data in a minute too, the water that's coming in down deep is warm and salty. And so the density is greater than the fresh and uh, cool water at the surface. Great question. I think oh. One from online. Uh, now that the ferry is no longer running from Portland, do you have another shipboard data or are you you're just using the robotic gliders? Uh, no, um, we use uh, small research vessels, which unfortunately is more expensive. And, uh, and no one was sadder than me to see that the ferry move over to Bar Harbor. But we can't use it from Bar Harbor because we've got this time series that's been going for 23 years. And if we move it, the transect, then uh, uh, things will will change and we can't really compare. So yeah, we use uh, the research vessel Connecticut uh, primarily. So Barney, do we have enough satellites? Um, well, one, uh, uh, yes and no. Um, the, the aqua, uh, modus aqua, is on its last legs and its orbit is starting to change. So they start losing altitude and when they lose altitude, then that means their, their equatorial crossing time, the time that they're flying over the equator starts changing. And ideally for one of these satellites, you wanna have the sun behind you when you're crossing the equator and uh, so that you get the most reflectance. And the, the overpass, the, the time that the uh, modus aqua is, is going to cross the equator is going to be 3 p.m. in about a year. And at that point, uh, it's not very useful. Uh, and so they'll probably have to, to stop. 
another question from online. Uh, when you're taking samples using a bucket on the ferry, how do you do that? Do you slow, does the captain have to slow the vessel? Do you like have a lot of safety ropes? Great question. Yeah. And, and he, let me tell you, you cannot take a, a bucket sample from a, a cap ferry at 38 knots. It would take you, take your arm right off. Um, but at 20 knots, uh, we got pretty good at it. And, and, uh, um, you know, it's we had a we started with a special bucket that had a flap on the bottom that would allow you dip in the water. The flap would go up, the water would come in, and then you lift it out, and the flap goes down, and it would give you time to get the thing aboard. And uh, so, yeah, it, it takes practice. <laughs> We've lost a few buckets. I hate to say. Uh, you mentioned the uh, surface water change. Um, is about three degrees centigrade. Any idea in terms of the, uh, the I, I guess, warmer, saltier water flowing into this trough of, you know, through a trough into the uh, 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 Gulf of Maine, uh, the, the temperature variation or increase that's occurred uh, there? I'm actually going to show you data uh, right out after we, after we have this break. So I'll answer it. It was a plant. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Any? There, there was uh, another. Oh, one more. This may be too complicated, but only it seems to me the only thing that a satellite can see is visual, I and mean, that is real color of the water. And yet you turn that into salinity data and temperature data. Well, I tell you, I told you, you have to ask them. Yeah. Uh, what's the magic involved in that? So Aquarius uses microwave, it's radar. And uh, the radar reflection uh, is a function of the salinity. So you're not looking in the visual beyond no. all of them. No. Some of no. it obviously is. Uh, uh, optics, uh, indeed, for ocean color, uh, we can't have clouds or fog out there when we go, which is why it's so critical with the ferry that we can we can see when clear weather is coming in. Um, the the Aquarius satellite can see through clouds, so it, it there's no no issue whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Okay, one more. Will you be getting into the impact of these temperature changes on the fishing industry? Yeah, I, I won't be talking about fishing so much uh, as the productivity of these microbes uh, on which they depend. Okay, take okay. it away, Barney. Okay, so let's um, let's talk about a little evidence for what has changed. Um, the first thing here is the temperature and the salinity of the Gulf are increasing top to bottom. That's the statement, and what's the evidence of that? Um, so on the left-hand side here, are temperature anomalies, and I misspoke. I said three degrees. It's actually about two degrees on these these plots. Each each of these strips here uh, is one depth, and it goes from one meter all the way down to two hundred and fifty meters. This is about midway across the Gulf, and where it says zero, that's the average temperature, and where it's blue. Uh, that is a negative anomaly. It's colder than average. And where it's red, it's warmer than average. And so the thing I want you to note is this, this particular data stream uh, in 2002, um, it, we're seeing negative anomalies right up till about 2010. And then we started seeing at depth uh, positive anomalies here. Uh, and at the very in the surface layer, it took about another two two years, one and a half years, when we started seeing these positive anomalies in the surface waters. So so there was a time difference, and it, what was what we think was happening was this warm water was coming in, and then over the course of a winter with lots of mixing, that water would start getting mixed upwards into the surface waters. And so 2012 was our first marine heat wave in the Gulf of Maine, that where water temperatures were just off the charts. Um, now on the, the right side, 
is a salinity anomaly. This is, uh, salinity is measured as a, in practical salinity units. It's just to say uh, it's a unit. Uh, it used to be parts per thousand, but uh, let's, uh, the, it's, it's usually about 33 of these units. And where the line is blue here, it's about minus one below that. And where it's red, it's about uh, here, it's about a half a unit above. But the same general trend, you're seeing blue values here up until about 2010. And then uh, down deep, we started seeing higher salinities. And then in the surface waters, about a year, year, two years later. So it was warm, salty water that was coming in down deep. This is the fingerprint, if you will, of North, what's called North Atlantic slope water, um, the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream has been moving north. And as it moves north and it gets, it moves right in front of the Northeast Channel, that water is the only water that can come into the Gulf. And whereas before we had that Labrador, that fresher Labrador seawater, which was going by the Northeast Channel, and that was the water that would move into the Gulf of Maine. So, so yes, we are seeing a change in the water masses in the Gulf of Maine. Over time scale, we went from, you know, this is sort of a 10 year time scale that we've seen this change occur. What has changed? Uh, the Gulf of Maine phytoplankton biomass, remember that image I showed with, uh, with uh, Charlie Yench in it, of chlorophyll. We use chlorophyll as an indicator of the biomass of phytoplankton. How much of it is there? It's a standing stock. It's, it's an amount. Uh, and we've seen that that on average has declined by about one and a half percent per year. It's, it's actually pretty subtle to see in the field of variability that actually exists in the Gulf of Maine. And here's, so here's the, the actual evidence. There's a lot of variability, first of all. So here's time on this axis. I'm gonna be showing you a couple of plots just like this. This is in years. And then this is the phytoplankton biomass in milligrams of chlorophyll, like in the plants, uh, per meter cubed of volume. And each one of these vertical lines is one cruise. And so in the, as you cross all these water masses in the Gulf of Maine, you cross a lot of different, uh, uh, a wide variety of biomass of phytoplankton. But there's a mean trend on there, which is highly statistically significant, which is downward at about one and a half percent per year. And um, that's, that's noteworthy. We're not the first ones to see that. Actually, the people who do look at satellite chlorophyll of the globe have seen a similar number of about a percent per year. Um, so what else has changed? Uh, the average Gulf of Maine productivity. Now, when I use the word productivity, I'm referring to a rate, something per unit time. Um, and, and that's essentially how much carbon these plants are taking, taking up per unit time, per day. And we measure that in every trip all across, right across the Gulf of Maine. And we put all those data together to look at, at how things are now as compared to how they used to be. And so the statement is that the productivity is about a third of what it was in the early 2000s. And Here's the evidence. So uh, the, you see the, the dynamic variability, which can be as much as an order of magnitude, 10 times variability that you would see in productivity in one trip as you cross the Gulf of Maine. Um, but this is the, the trend, which is highly statistically significant, means it's highly unlikely to occur by chance. Uh, and uh, that's a, this is probably the single most important result for this paper that we just published. That's a big deal. Uh, and this is the material, these are the organisms that all the zooplankton are depending on that are eaten by the fish, that are eaten by the bigger fish, right? This is the bottom of the marine food web on which all life in the ocean depends. 
And uh, these are the primary producers. They're taking light and converting it into carbon. And that's the productivity rate. <laughs> What else has changed? Well, if you take that photosynthetic rate and you divide it by the amount of carbon that's there, you get what is called a growth rate. And, and just think of it as how many times these plants divide in a day. And so that's what we've done. And that growth rate has decreased because it's related to both the photosynthesis and the carbon. Uh, it's decreased about 50%. Over the, over the course of the time series. Here's the evidence, uh, and there's the trend. Um, plants have changed. The species that are there have changed. And that's because with different water masses coming in, there are different nutrients. Uh, some of the, the plants need certain types of nutrients that others don't. And so these coccolithophores, which are one of my favorite organisms on Earth, um, and you walked right by a six-foot replica of one as you were coming in. Uh, there, it's called Emiliania huxleyi out there. It is just a fabulous sculpture. That's what they really look like, but they're really small. Um, and uh, the numbers of them have decreased to 20, less than 25% of what they used to be. Now, there are other plankton that have gotten their, have gotten uh, uh, more concentrated. They're winners and they're losers. And the dinoflagellates are actually going up. I'm gonna show you the, what the data for the coccolithophores look like. There's a highly uh, significant negative trend here. Um, and the last thing I wanna talk about just briefly is ocean acidification. So <clears throat> it's, a com it's more complicated. And it's maybe a little counterintuitive. Uh, the question I had back there about ocean acidification. Um, as we burn fossil fuels, we put CO2 into the air. That CO2 goes into the ocean. It uh, turns into carbonic acid, and it makes the ocean more acidic. And this is a problem for organisms that make shells for a living. They use those shells to protect themselves from being eaten by other organisms. It's a jungle out there. And um, so as we put more CO2 into the air, the ocean is indeed becoming more uh, acidic. However, the problem is we have, we've gone from Labrador seawater, uh, which is coming into the Gulf, to North Atlantic slope water, and they have different chemical characteristics. So the data for, I'm gonna show you data for something, it's, it's 25 cent words here, aragonite saturation coefficient. It's basically a number that if it's above 1.6, um, everything's fine. If it hits 1.6, organisms have a hard time making their shell. If it goes below one, the shells dissolve, okay? so. Here's uh, the evidence. We've only been measuring ocean acidification uh, parameters since about 2012, so we don't have as long a database. Uh, these are larva, larval clams here that actually have a little tiny shell on them. And this is the saturation coefficient for aragonite, which is a material that they're made of. And the trend is actually going up. And, and you're all saying, oh, well, I thought you said that the, the ocean is getting more acidic. Well, <clears throat> first thing to note, here's this magic 1.6 number below which the larvae cannot make their shell. So, and you see, we, we have some data that are falling below that. And then here's the value of one, where below that shells dissolve. And, and probably one of the big surprises is, we had two months during this period of 2015, late 2014 and 2015, where consistently, most of the way across the Gulf of Maine, we were seeing values of less than one. And what happens is there's some chemistry involved, but the colder the water, the more CO2 it absorbs and the more acidic it gets. And this positive trend here is related to this North Atlantic slope water, which is warmer. It doesn't hold as much CO2, so it's not as acidic. And so, so we have two things going on here. Like I say, it's a, a little bit more complicated, but that's the Gulf of Maine. It's a complex place. So in conclusion, the Nats Transect time series is 23 years old. 
Uh, time series are utterly invaluable to understand a complex natural system like the Gulf of Maine and to have any sort of precision to be able to quantify change. The Gulf of Maine is complicated and it has lots of variability. It's not all one soup. It is a, a highly diverse place um, that has uh, each of the water masses has different properties. Phytoplankton biomass is decreasing on average about one and a half percent per year. The productivity is a third of what it was in the early 2000s. Remember, this is what's the bottom of the marine food web on which all life in the ocean depends. Phytoplankton growth rates are on average about half of what they were in the early 2000s. And it's the difference between dividing maybe uh, once per day and a half per day. So it takes two days to divide. Phytoplankton species are changing. There are winners and losers. Some species can do better in North Atlantic slope water. Others can't. And the circulation changes are bringing in this warm, salty North Atlantic water. Uh, there's a slightly higher aragonite saturation coefficient in the surface associated with this new water mass. But there are these episodic high mixing events that bring up deep corrosive water in winter months. And if you're a larva out there when that aragonite saturation coefficient is less than one, you're going to be naked and you're going to be easy fodder for your predator. So what can we do? First, uh, I strongly believe that we need to support a transition off of a carbon-based economy. This won't be easy, but it is critical and time is short. The more we burn fossil fuels, the more that you heard Debbie talk about this, the more PCO2 goes up, the warmer the temperatures are going to be, and the more acidic the ocean overall is going to become. Um, if, and, and one of the reasons I see, uh, 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 one of the reasons for some optimism here that we can actually do this was that if one watches, looks at the CO2 level on the top of Mauna Loa, a very remote mountain in the Hawaiian island chain where they have uh, people measuring the CO2 up there. During the pandemic, two years, uh, we're, where lots of people weren't driving as much as they used to, and the trajectory of CO2 started to fall off. We can do this. We can do this. Uh, and, and there have been other economic studies looking at economic slowdowns and the CO2 because of the economy, the global economy changing. The, the rate of increase of CO2 starts to fall off when the economy, when people stop burning stuff. I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to. But time is short. Um, it, we really don't have an indefinite amount of time. Tune in next week for Dr. Ben Twining's Cafe Sci, where he's going to be presenting a, a talk called Course Correction, Can Ocean CO2 Removal Reduce the Cost of Rising Emissions? So while I'm saying we need to shut off the spigot, of letting the CO2 out, Ben's gonna be talking about ways that people are thinking about possibly uh, to pull some of the CO2 in the atmosphere out and get it in a place where it's not warming the planet. Uh, support science. You know, um, uh, this uh, is doing uh, calibrated scientific measurements is the way that we're seeing what's happening and it's utterly critical. Uh, that, that uh, in order for us to understand what's going to happen, we need to have scientific measurements. Treat your fishermen and fisherwomen well, because the productivity of the Gulf of Maine is probably going to be decreasing. And, and uh, Rick Wally, a lobster uh, scientist who looks at the larval sediment index, has shown some reports of larval sediment falling off these larvae eat copepods that eat the phytoplankton. And the past couple of years, the larval sediment's going down. Um, so treat these people well, because they may have a harder time making a living pretty soon. And vote for science at the ballot box. Uh, people that uh, make decisions related to the trajectory of CO2 
Uh, you need to think carefully and ask if they're going to follow this route. And uh, I'd also like to thank NASA for funding all these years. It's not easy, uh, but they've kept us going for all these years. Uh, eight vessels uh, have helped us in all of our crossings. We have a couple of research vessels uh, and, and one fishing vessel. And I acknowledge uh, there are uh, 62 names here, of people that have helped us over these 23 years uh, with these trips. I mean, it, it takes a village to pull us off, and, and all these people work like dogs uh, on these trips, uh, especially when we're on the high-speed ferry and there's only half an hour between every water sampling. We are just beat by the end of it. Uh, and then at the bottom, I'd like to acknowledge the Bigelow Communication and IT folks who helped set up this hybrid presentation, which is not easy. So uh, thanks to Stephen, Fritz, Joe, and Kevin. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Okay, questions. Uh, we have some questions up front too. Sorry, I have a question. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, she's got the microphone, so. <laughs> Hi, how is the melting of the Greenland ice sheet going to affect the Gulf of Maine? Um, well, uh, so right now, uh, there is some interesting papers that have been published about this Labrador current, which is carrying that fresh water, which is resulting from that ice melt. And right now, because the Gulf Stream has moved so far north, that water is being diverted to the east towards Europe. And it's, it's a lot of water we're talking about. And so um, that, that fresh water from the melting ice flow may not be reaching the Gulf of Maine uh, because it's being shunted off to the east. Uh, Barney, uh, when you talked about the decrease in phytoplankton in the Gulf of Maine and uh, the decrease in productivity, you it said a lot. It sounds like a lot of it has to do with the changing in ocean chemistry. So, you know, we hear a lot about reducing phosphate and nitrogen going into the Gulf of Maine, but of course, that's those are the nutrients that the phytoplankton needs. So, yeah. should we put more sewage into no, the. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, but there, there's a little bit of an enamel. <laughs> yeah, we like that. But you, you, you really know how to get me going here. No. Uh, um, uh, so just just a, just a quick comment. Um, so Labrador current water has more silicate in it. And so the diatoms, which Henry Bigelow said are the fish food, his epithet was uh, all fish is diatoms, is, is what he said. And uh, so silicate levels of the water coming in are actually going down. And there's uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, which is more representative of these waters of the North, uh, North Atlantic slope waters. And uh, so, no, we, uh, we shouldn't be pumping sewage in. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but th these are the things that are going to cause changes in species, in predators of those species. Uh, so you think about callinus, which prefers colder water. Now is Calinus basically going to be heading further north, which the, tr the trend has been there. So um, this is uh, basically telling, uh, you know, we're the, we're the messenger at this point saying, you know, this is what's happening. But, you know, you can expect changes in the taxa of the phytoplankton that are in the Gulf of Maine associated with these. Going back to your uh, graph on the warming and the cooling, yes. what happened in 2012 that caused that? Is that well, it's like a, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that, it, that's a that's a great question. That's a whole seminar in itself. But um, there are people who use their satellites that look at ocean currents. They can actually estimate the ocean currents from. Uh, they're looking at sea surface height. Believe it or not. Sea level is not the same over the ocean. And as water moves, it piles up water in one place and it's lower in another place. And what they observed was it was like a switch happened 
people are still trying to understand what caused that switch to go when the North Atlantic slope water suddenly took over and uh, shunting that Labrador current water out to the east. But it was, it, they called it a dipole, like a dipole switch. And, and physical oceanographers are, are still debating about what caused it, but they could see it in the sea surface height change that happened around the Grand Banks, believe it or not. It was uh, just south of the Grand Banks. They noticed that the sea surface height changed and that's what, that's what switched it. Um, they're not talking about that, uh, as, uh, but, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. So uh, she was asking uh, if, if the wobble of the Earth's axis could be causing it. Um, I don't think so. Um, and, uh, but there are big things happening in the North Atlantic, which I haven't even touched on, where what's called Atlantic Meridional Overturn Circulation. This is a, this is a, a giant overturn. This is where water in the North Atlantic around Greenland sinks in the winter. And that water flows all the way down to about 2,000 meters, 2,000 meters, and you can follow it through the Atlantic over to the Indian sector, over into the Pacific and through the Southern Ocean and follow it all the way into the North Pacific where it rises up again. This is a huge, yeah, and, and it's related to, that change is related to ocean heating in the North Atlantic. It's harder to make that water go down when you warm the surface ocean. All right, we've got another one from online. Uh, are there any indications that bacterial activity in the Gulf of Maine has increased with increased temperatures and then that nutrient cycling could speed up? Mm, that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question. We, we have, were never, as a, as a time series by, uh, funded by NASA, they were interested in the phytoplankton part of that. So we, we have not measured bacterial metabolism. We've talked about it before. Um, <clears throat> and certainly as temperatures go up, both uh, growth rates uh, should increase uh, for bacteria as well. And uh, another thing that, that I, I didn't even touch on, but uh, there have been changes in precipitation patterns over this time series. In the years 2006 through 2009, we had some of the highest rainfall. These were century scale rain events. These were rain events, you might remember, that were washing out covered bridges in New Hampshire. These old covered bridges, they, they just, the rivers were overflowing. And that rain, the difference was uh, typical rainfall in the Gulf of Maine is, uh, in the area is 1.2 meters of rain per year. And it got up to 1.6, 1.65 meters per year during those wet years. That dumped all sorts of humic material, soils, and organic matter into the Gulf of Maine, which we could see because of our optical instrumentation, we could see it um, 50 miles offshore. The water was the color of tea, 50 miles offshore. And I've got pictures, I didn't put it in here, but we, we saw this on deck and we could not believe our eyes. And, and that was when we were crossing that Eastern Maine coastal current and all of this terrigenous debris came into the Gulf and was being swept down the coast of Maine right across our cruise track. Well, that's, that's bacteria combust that stuff. They, that is food for bacteria. And we have no idea what that did for bacterial growth. So I'm sorry to say. When you compared your data from the, the surface measurements to the satellites, were there, it, was it a perfect correlation? Were there any surprises? In other words, are there any blind sides, uh, you know, blind spots to the satellites? Um, one of the reasons it's hard to do remote sensing in the Gulf of Maine is that there is this colored organic matter which comes down the rivers, it's like tea. Just think of a, a, a tea bag that gets steeped in the summer. Right now, it's warm in them there hills and rain falls and it steeps that tea and it goes into the rivers and, and goes down the rivers and we see it out at sea. Um, uh, so you can, you can actually see correlations between salinity ocean salinity 
and the color of this tea right out into the Gulf of Maine. And it, because it's it being carried with fresh water, the more fresh water is in it, uh, the lower the salinity goes. So the, the higher this, this organic matter is. So it's a pretty good correlation. It's not the same for every river because one river will have bogs on it, another river won't. And, and uh, so that ch changes the sorts of material that's available to be steeped. Um, obviously, all of the bodies of water in the world each have their unique sets of characteristics um, and factors that are going into this, but do you have a sense that all bodies of water in the world are in fact getting warmer and more acidic, or are there some which perhaps have opposite trends? Um, good question. Uh, areas where, it, and it's through time series that we've been able to see this, the longest time series that we have for ocean acidification are out at Hawaii and at Bermuda. Those are 25 to 30 year time series. And, uh, and so we, we don't really have data sets from many other water masses of that extent. And you know ours is only 12 years of measurements of, of ocean acidification. And so uh, it, it's part of that making the measurement over and over stuff that allows you to see these trends. At, at Bermuda and at Hawaii, the trends are irrefutable. The, the, the ocean acidity is, is going up, the pH is going down. There's a... Okay, uh, one, this will be the last question. For all these years, we've been burning fossil fuel, CO2, one of the primary products of the combustion is water. And it turns out that one gallon of diesel fuel, gasoline, jet fuel puts out 1.3 gallons of water, increasing fresh water all over the world. Plus, we've had our glaciers melting that have been there for thousands of years, running down into the ocean. And is this effect of the salinity, is it a measurable effect on the salinity of the ocean? Well, I, I can't speak for the contribution of water from combustion on what that would, uh, it, how, the, the amount of water that would be resulting from burning 38 gigatons of uh, oil every year, oil and coal, basically, that we do. And so it would be, I, I imagine it would be a fair amount, but the, uh, uh, what was the second part of your question? And all the melting of the glaciers. Oh, and, and well, certainly as, as, as we melt uh, the Greenland ice cap, or certainly Antarctica, as that melts, believe you me, the salinity is going to decrease as, as sea level height rises uh, associated with that as well. I mean, you take a mile of ice uh, over Antarctica, and that will certainly, if you melt that, that will lower the salinity of the ocean. Yeah. That's a really good question. That would be a good question. If anybody's a college professor, put that on an exam. Because that would be, uh, they, they would hate you. Um, okay, well, thank you. Uh, let's give Barney uh, another round of applause. Thank you.